You're listening to Innovators, the podcast from Harris Search Associates, where we speak with global leaders in education, research, engineering, and the health sciences, and ask them to share lessons learned as they continue to advance the frontiers of innovation and discovery. Today's podcast will be led by Rick Skinner, Senior Consultant. This is the second of a series of Innovators podcasts devoted to the state of pediatric research, its relationship with children's hospitals, and the type of leadership called for by both the research and hospital organizations. In the May 2017 issue of the journal Pediatrics, three researchers, Tina Ching, Clifford Bogue, and George Dover, forecast seven great pediatric research achievements to come about in a not too distant future. The forecast was based on responses to an open-ended survey from pediatricians who are also professional board members. The authors acknowledge the intellectual risk of such an undertaking, even if drawing on the views of experts in the field of pediatric research. There are far more good historians than there are prophets, they noted, if only because most people are very much conservative and tend to predict the future as an extension of the recent past and immediate present. Nevertheless, Ching, Bogue, and Dover hazarded the following seven promising areas of research on the verge of breakthroughs that will impact the health of children, adolescents, adults, and communities. One, more pediatric immunizations prevent emerging and persistent diseases. Two, cancer immunotherapy in pediatrics shows promise. Three, Genomic discoveries predict, prevent, and more effectively treat diseases. Four, big life course data recognize fetal and childhood origins of adult health and disease, resulting in effective early intervention. Five, knowledge of the interaction of biology and the physical and social environment leads to effective prevention for individual and population health. Six, Quality improvement science creates safe, efficient systems of care. <clears throat> Excuse me. Seven, and last, implementation and dissemination research reduces global poverty. In this and future innovators' interviews, we ask persons steeped in the worlds of pediatric research in children's hospitals to provide their respective assessment of the progress made or delayed in the seven achievements, and in the process hope to understand the role leadership plays in administering the organizations that are the home to children's research and care. We begin our series with Dr. Mark Batshaw, Executive Vice President, Physician in Chief and Chief Academic Officer at Children's National Hospital. Today, we have the pleasure of learning from Mark Letitia, President and CEO of the Children's Hospital Association. The association is composed of more than 220 children's hospitals with a principal focus on the United States and includes leading children's hospitals from around the world in Asia Pacific, Europe, and North America. The association sees itself as the champion of children's health by focusing its collective efforts through close collaboration of its member hospitals in policy, quality, and safety best practices, as well as data analytics to inform decision-making of clinicians, policymakers, payers and providers. Mr. Wittisha is in his 10th year as the association's CEO. Before that, he was chairman of Kurt Salmon, a global consulting firm where he was a senior partner and founding member of the firm's healthcare practice. He earned the MBA from both Ohio State and the University of Indiana, and one suspects falls prey to schizophrenia when those two institutions intercollegiate teams do battle. He serves as a trustee of the Council of Test Teaching Hospitals, a former trustee and chair of the Health System Board of Overseers for UCLA Health, as well as performing service to the University of Michigan School of Public Health, advisor to Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, and New York University's Langone Medical, Medical Center. Most recently, Mr. Witeka joined the board of NCAN and de dedicated to bringing an end to child abuse. Welcome to Innovators. The Children's Hospital Association is particularly influential by virtue of the fact that you provide the results of analyses of clinicians' decision-making when they treat children. 
So as you look back on the last four years uh, since the publication of that pediatrics journal article, which of the seven achievements that the authors wrote about you see as having made real progress in recent years and which one or more perhaps hasn't moved as quickly as we hoped? Sure. The, the areas that we have found most promising and have such great potential for the future are just the impact of our society, our environments uh, on people's health. Um, the work on that has been transformative. And it's something that just wasn't uh, quite baked into the system if you look back over you know, prior years. So it's well determined now, and we saw this in the pandemic, people that are isolated, uh, put aside from all of their colleagues and neighbors, there's a actual health impact on that. A lot of this is what we'd call behavioral or mental health, but behavioral and physical health are connected. People that have physical problems get depressed. People that are isolated get higher blood pressure. So this whole field of what we would call the social determinants, meaning where you live, uh, up in Baltimore, you can find parts of the town where people actually have life expectancies that are five, 10 years shorter than living in another part of the town. And this isn't necessarily due to whether they can get to Whole Foods or not, although that's related, uh, but the whole environment, the amount of stress in it, whether it's safe, uh, whether it's actually got a capacity to have relationships with neighbors and your community, whether you can get outside and have some fun and enjoy nature, all those things are connected. And so when we look at those seven pieces, the connection of society and our physical well being, our biology, um, our ability to have predictive analytics on this, uh, you, the question of big data was raised. And these are things we can measure. We know by tax returns and everything else where people live and where they went to college and how much money they make. And Amazon has made it possible now. We know what you eat and we know what you buy. So you can profile a person's uh, kind of. Uh, living conditions, and then start looking at their health. Uh, the other thing I would say is in the science of it, these adverse childhood experiences, which were uh, a database collected uh, back in the 70s, early 80s. And these were uh, basically reviews of the early lives of folks. And um, did they have drug abusing parents? Did they grow up uh, witnessing um, unsafe events? And then they looked at their health 20 years later. And these uh, adverse childhood experiences or ACEs really mapped pretty closely to your adult health. And lately, uh, uh, Dr. Christina Bethel up at Johns Hopkins has done some work on positive childhood experiences. You know, do you have friends? Do you have people that care about you? Did anybody see you when you're out and about? And these things actually contribute to, to positive health. So, that zone of living experiences, relationships with people, uh, friends, family, have all correlated in ways that are reshaping public policy now and are reshaping how we think about having kids in school, uh, how we've just been probably the number one driver of getting kids back to school and out of their bedroom isolation on Zoom has been their behavioral health has deteriorated sitting by themselves. So this has been, uh, these have been the two areas that uh, we think are just powerful. And particularly in kids' hospitals, we deal with kids. You've got your whole 60, 70 year runway in front of you. It's very different than when you're dealing with Medicare and a lot of 70 and 80 year olds, they're all precious people too, but they're not looking at 70 more years, at least not yet. So we have a developmental impact on the kids that is really a pretty big deal. On the flip side, the things that maybe haven't moved uh, to quite the same degree probably relate to what must be now a decades, if not hundreds year quest to think that technology and knowing a lot about our genes is going to fix poverty, is going to um, solve global warming, is going to make us so smart and progressive that we can overcome these meta problems. 
And that has been an area that, uh, if anything, we, we might even going backwards on, you know, I think what we've done is create a planet of 7 billion people who all know how the top 1% of people live and all want to be that in ways that cause us to use a lot of resources and fight over resources. There's a lot of conflict uh, in the planet. And while we have uh, a growing awareness of what that is, um, you know, when you take a look at uh, many of our biggest population centers, and those would be China, India, and the US, we're the three biggest countries on the planet, we all have substantial impoverished populations, and we all have substantial economies that uh, burn an enormous amount of fossil fuel. And it's not really clear how we can get what is effectively uh, close to 3 billion people between the three groups uh, into a place that are going to be um, a better place in the immediate short handful of years, in the longer term, perhaps. But those are just uh, some opening thoughts on the set. Just a quick question about the, the whole issue of life expectancy. Uh, there have been any number of reports now that have said not only have that among male high school graduates and, and the like, we've seen a drop there. There's the associated view that says we're going to have a drop simply because of the disproportionate number of deaths that we had from COVID. Um, that hasn't affected children as much, I'm told, that in that they have not contracted the disease or have not contracted the disease as severely. But do we have any pinch, any sense now of what affect this experience of a pandemic? Not only the disease, but the conditions that were created to cope with that. Do we have a sense yet of what that's going to mean developmentally? Well, that's a very, very interesting question because the COVID impact is, you know, give or take about a year old. So our data window of looking at 2019 versus today is a narrower one. I would say on your big picture, and, uh, and then I'll bring it back around to the behavioral health and uh, the kids' health piece. If you looked 100 years ago, we had a fairly substantial mortality challenge in young kids. And it was infectious disease. It was accidents. There were things that today in most parts of the United States we heavily solved for. So we don't have uh, infant mortality at the same rates we used to. The curves here have just been traumatic. And we can save kids now who are premature down to a pound, half a pound. I mean, just crazy numbers. So for kids, surviving childhood physically has improved. So we've seen, and this of course translates then into the whole population. We've got 80 million kids in the United States, maybe 20, 25% of all of us. The fact that a large block of them are not dying as two and three year olds kind of lifts the overall picture for everybody. The question of uh, children over the next block of time is not a physical health challenge. It's not that that's uh, trivial any longer, but we don't have kids uh, dying of physical trauma and um, infectious disease at the rate. We have higher levels, or at least we are able now to, to diagnose and measure these of mental and behavioral health problems. And that's what we learned in the COVID environment. Kids are pretty resilient to respiratory viruses. That's always been true. And um, unless they're highly immunocompromised or in really poor health or have a high challenge of obesity, you know, those categories of younger people um, had a far lower resistance. But generally speaking, the kids were fairly bulletproof, uh, very few hospitalizations uh, for the most part, uh, you know, wouldn't want to say they're immortal, but you know, they don't get hit by the flu and things like that much either. The behavioral impact was really fairly profound and quick. We shut down schools, playgrounds, extracurricular activities. We shut down sports. You can go out with your friends for adolescence, no high school experience, no dances, no football games, and no proms, and no graduations. Uh, that whole infrastructure of relational development 
was really put onto uh, a screen. And while that's got some value to it, we certainly have learned how to make Zoom and these other things a more, a more profound relational medium. It's not the same thing as hanging out uh, with your friends and all of the cues and energy and experiences that you have in real time, whether you're stuck in the pouring rain or in a snowstorm. So for kids, the behavioral aspect was, was really accelerated. We had a pre-existing problem, which was a lot of despair and uh, darkness in kids. Um, some of this just gets to be their expectations of their life. The world's competitive. Everybody's got to look good, uh, get in good colleges, get good jobs. That's always been true to some degree. Mobile technology, the internet has accelerated the awareness of how well you're doing or not doing in real time. Parents have become uh, just almost relentless hovering. You know, we have helicopters. We now have analogs for this, metaphors. You know, helicopter parents, hovering parents. Um, you know, one example of just how all this converges is this attention deficit syndrome. So, you know, we have this like all of a sudden a pandemic of children who can't focus. Yeah, the old in the old days, somebody would just say that's because they're children, and you know they're not really designed to sit inside for ten hours a day, studying and staring at Zoom screens. But we live in a knowledge worker society now. We live in a computational society, digital society. People need to get credentialed. They need to build their knowledge skills. They need a resume, experiences. These kind of things are not free. And you've got to be able to sit down and study. Our general pediatricians tell us the major pressure for attention deficit meds are often parents who are afraid their kids can't sit down and crank their homework out for eight hours after they've been in school all day for seven. And uh, they need them to calm down and focus, this concept of focusing. Uh, when I was in college, the way we would focus would just take endless amounts of coffee and caffeine pills. Those seem to be the remedies of the day. Uh, but now we have a much wider armamentarium in the use of anti-anxiety drugs, uh, sleep medication, uh, all kinds of things, mood disorder, uh, things we're we've become kind of a pharma society and the kids are at the front line of that and they carry that into their young adulthood the idea that you grow out of this has not been proven true and so um, central nervous system meds have been kind of the intervention barrier for kids behavioral health and that that nexus has really created uh, you know in many ways a, a crisis uh, that we are now dealing with do you think that the reasons for the success that been realized in pediatric research. Are there particular factors that you think made that possible? And similarly, can you, in your mind, specify factors that made uh, those aspects that didn't come about as much as we thought they would? Can you, do you have a sense of why that was the case? You know, we have a, so if you start with our basic health system, mm -hmm. what we have is a legacy system. It's evolved over quite a period of time. Um, 1960s kind of gave us Medicare and Medicaid and really public medicine, publicly funded medicine in a large way. And it was, it was predicated on fixing severe physical health problems. So if you get cancer, have a stroke, have heart disease, get in an auto wreck, you know, blunt trauma, we are geared to fix those things. We pay a lot of money to fix those things. And the research kind of follows that. So it's no, no small uh, uh, coincidence that we spend um, huge volumes of dollars on cancer research, for example, and have been for decades. You probably put people on other planets for what we spent on this, and we haven't actually solved that problem. Um, heart disease, neurologic disease, you know, people worry about things like uh, autism and Parkinson's, and we, we put a ton of dollars into those, and we spend a lot of money to fix those problems or to try to fix those problems in our health system. 
So if you take that and hold it there for a minute, mm -hmm. that is a slow moving train. And the research that we talked about on relational health, well-being, uh, being able to look at your living conditions as a major part of your health care, not just whether you've got a subscription and primary care doctor, but do you actually uh, get any sunlight? Do you have any friends? Uh, do you have any hobbies? Is there anything you do besides sit on Zoom all day and work? And we have knowledge there in the research end, but that has not made it in to the healthcare delivery system in a major way. So well child visits, you know, this is a well-established concept that take your kids in for preventative developmental care. Um, these things generally are same as well-being or wellness for adults. This is all aimed at prevention. Um, we don't do well here. We will pay a lot of money if you jump off a building because you're in despair and land on the ground, we will airlift you to any number of medical centers and neurosurgeons will take over. Everybody kind of works on you. We will spend a million dollars, but we spend very little to actually figure out how you got depressed. Is anyone looking after you or are you engaged in a health system that lets everyone see, you know, how your life's progressing? Uh, what's, uh, what's the mental health status you've got and what are the contributing factors? You know, all the simple little things. We don't spend anything on that. No one's really trained to do that. That's why we have a shortage of people. So the research that is really promising are on our relationships and our environment, but the actual medical system is still kind of drail, dragging behind. Uh, and we're, we're focused on fixing physical problems, which are important, but many of those are things that are early childhood development issues. Many of those are chronic lifestyle issues. And we don't uh, spend a lot on prevention, awareness of this, we're getting better. But when you wade into the piece, even the amount of research on social determinants and well-being is not nearly funded at the level of cancer and heart work. You know, We're still trying to beat the odds of all of our physical mortality. And we've got a health system that's really geared to to that. It's so that's a bit of this synchronous issue of how the search relates to where the demand is. Let me follow up on that. Much of the determinant data is at a, a macro level. It's about large groups of population and the correlates with certain phenomena in a given jurisdiction. That doesn't translate very readily into what does a doctor need to be asking a parent or a child. Uh, in order to prevent illness. So it strikes me that, that some of the analysis, while helpful, is still more in the realm of public health than it is medicine per se. And in particular, it's not really that helpful in causing us to look forward to what admittedly you acknowledge, I think you acknowledge are big problems when you have inequities like we're talking about. So that explains at least part of why some of the research didn't advance. For the research that went forward, what made the difference there? Was it money? Was it investment? Was it technology? Was it, was it change in some sort of aspect of the health system? What made those prep progress come about? Money is a pretty big deal in this whole thing. Uh, for example, probably we have put more dollars into genetic sequencing, gene mapping, gene intervention, uh, redesigning uh, DNA, redesigning uh, molecules and trying to figure out how to um, reverse and prevent work. Enormous amounts of dollars and they were not just public dollars through the National Institutes of Health and related but a great number of private corporations, Genentech and companies like this were able to get in. And so when you have a lot of dollars, you've got a lot of smart people working on something and they can make living off of it. The um, point you raised on the issue of the social determinants and you know how to make that granular, how to get that into practice, there is more there than most of us know. The basic issue is our doctors are really um, paid to fix bigger problems. So the cardiovascular surgeons are 
probably paid the most. They fix the most dramatic problems of brain surgeons. The primary care folks, people that work in behavioral health, mental health, relatively less compensated for that. And most people don't want to take a lot of time and effort or put another way, they're not motivated to take a lot of time and effort to work on these fundamental pieces. The genetics piece and the things that have really taken off, of course, have captured people's imagination. I mean, if we could fix these things with pills rather than lifestyle, be much better alternative. So if you're telling me that my job is too stressful and I'm eating at too many of these beautiful DC restaurants, I need to lose weight, I'm eating too much sugar, those are the things that actually are how we're going to retract your health. They're just not very popular. So if I could reprogram my genetics or better yet, reprogram the food and get the impacts, the negative impacts out, we're gonna, we're gonna go for that. And I think you can see that uh, the work on some of these things aligns with populist culture. You know, people want to think that they can re, remake and rework and rethink things. And so um, that has driven, I think the resourcing and some of that has just got more glam factor for a lot of the, of the common public. What about the ways in which the research enterprise interacts with hospitals? Uh, you, your membership, over 200 children's hospitals, come in all shapes and sizes and colors and everything. Is there a, a particular model that at one and the same time allows and encourages those two organizations in their own individual missions, but at the same time promotes a kind of convergence between the research activity and the actual treatment. But I, I know there's a lot of diversity in that, but are there some that seem to do better than others? You know, re the research enterprise in academic medicine, uh, whether it's a children's or adult hospital, mm -hmm. and, and academic medicine, I mean, you take your classic Johns Hopkins or uh, University of California, mm -hmm. and you've got clinician scientists, people that are working in patient care, and they're working on the science. Uh, and then a whole host of people in the PhD and the other kind of groups who do the basic research and fundamental work. This is just almost entrepreneurial work in many of the universities. You've got to fund yourself. You need to come up with grants. You need to come up with students. Um, and in some regards, you can say, hey, the upside of that is we've created entrepreneurial driven people who are really pushing the envelope. Uh, the downside of it is that it is a threadbare, hard life for many people. If you can't come up with government funding, most universities, when they look at their medical schools or our children's hospitals, the university presidents look up and think, that's a college that can fund itself. You know, I, they should be able to bring in enough money to pay for their buildings, to pay for themselves, to pay for their equipment, to pay for the postdocs. Everybody ought to be kind of funded there. You don't see that going on in the art history department or in the uh, anthropology section. You know, here you've got to basically support people. And I do believe, to your point, that while our somewhat entrepreneurial system has produced some real flashes of, of brilliance. We don't have always great collegial cultures. We don't have always a great uh, collaborative environment because everyone's trying to get ahead. They're trying to get a credit for the idea. So people will, uh, you know, a great example are in these social determinants. One of the uh, confusing factors about that research is it's called something different by every famous author. You know, so I deal with adverse childhood experiences. Someone else deals with thriving neighborhoods. Someone else deals with, you know, uh, solving the inequity of, of life. And they're each, and their books are all taught different titles, and they talk about it with their own vocabulary. And as a result, for policymakers here in Washington, they're kind of straightforward people. They deal with the Defense Department. They buy guns, they buy people, they fight wars. It's very straightforward. You get into some of these other areas and the academics of it really can kind of blur the awareness and the messaging and what we're trying to do. And part of this is just simple. Um, it's uh, 
competitive model. You have to get your name out there if you're going to, to draw grants and students and, and speaking engagements. You have to get your ideas into the mind share of the field. And while there certainly is civil discourse between people, a lot, there's a lot of holding back and exploitation of groups by each other or of data they can get. And it's that way in science writ large, but I think particularly in these parts of pediatric hospital science, uh, that is uh, the dual edge of, and this is most research in pediatrics. You know, most of the time we're dealing with folks that have to make these programs go. And I would say the benefit of the kids hospital side is many of our clinician science researchers all work for the children's hospital. So they're in a common, Group. And this is also very common in Europe. And you'll see much more collaborative multidisciplinary um, centers and work in these kind of environments. So as far as the future, we need more stable platforms and more collaboration to accelerate work. It's, um, we should be able to have both. You know, the entrepreneurism ought to be there, but um, that's the kind of um, mix of research environments we have in the United States. And the kids' hospitals aren't different from the adults in that, and it's a capitalistic system to a large degree. And we uh, have these people working on discovery and also running a business of keeping themselves in the discovery business. And that's a hard to order to fill for some, for some folks. It all, we've touched in on, on organizational questions, but there's also the leadership question. It strikes me that when we talk about universities, there's the old line that says, yes, we've changed presidents over the last few years, but fortunately we haven't done much, they haven't done much damage and we're just about what we were like 20 years ago. Seldom are, are university presidents brought in to affect change, profound change. But what kind of leadership do we need for these organizations? Because it strikes me that it, it, it's easy to be on the side of the angels in both cases, I'm looking for the cure for blank, or I'm looking for this, and I'm looking to treat students who, uh, to treat children who are, who are struggling because of the adverse impact of, of long-term poverty. So, so it's there, it's, it's not hard to find the reason you should go into it, but I get the distinct impression these jobs are not easy jobs to do, and that it, not just anybody who's had an advanced degree from Wharton School can walk in and be effective. Is there some sort of leadership profile for people who run either the research enterprise and or the children's hospital? And if so, what does that person look like? Where did they come from and what makes them tick? Yes, the, the profiles differ a fair amount between someone who leads a children's hospital and someone who leads the academic enterprise. And when you get into the university definition of an academic enterprise, even more so. So the children's hospitals, these um, often are charitable, but private businesses that need to make a positive margin. They need to build their own buildings, pay their own mortgages, pay their people, fund retirements. Uh, they look a lot like many other corporations. Uh, their customers are the kids and families, their payment sources are their insurance plans and the government. And so you've got a complex ecosystem of a business that you run and the kind of person that runs that uh, looks a lot like the kind of people that might run Google or Apple or Microsoft. They've got a, scale, a difference in scale, but they've got similar responsibilities and they both have social responsibilities and so forth. The university leaders just have some of the toughest jobs out there, and they have gotten harder. If you take your classic public university uh, these days, um, most of the public line of support from the state has disappeared. Most states have removed that. Uh, they expect you to come up with that yourself. Now, your options here are I can increase the tuition on students becomes universally unpopular among everybody quickly. So there's a limit there. 
Uh, you can look for more research money, extramural funding, and ask your faculty to get funded. Now, this gets back to this entrepreneurism. So I'm making a, I'm make the faculty pay for this as condition of being here. Uh, and you start looking for philanthropy and donors and building endowments and fundraising, which has become a year around sport on every campus in the country. It's uh, something you do. And if you're lucky enough to have a football team, you might make some money there. And that's become a big deal to the point where you'll pay your coaches five, $10 million or more because they're bringing a hundred, $200 million program just in that. But an attempt to change this model is extremely difficult because you're producing assets or faculty, they're people. So you're gonna look up and say, hey, I've done a study of my faculty. I've got 5,000 professors here. A uh, thousand of them are tenured. As best I can tell, there's a good number of them that don't teach many classes and don't get many research grants. So I've got a brilliant idea. Why don't I increase the productivity of my workforce? So I'm gonna go out and lay on some new rules for the faculty. Increase their productivity thresholds. They have to teach more classes. They have to bring in more money. They get less time off. That's my plan. Well, there's not gonna be anybody on the faculty who thinks this is a good idea. And they have an unholy alliance with their students now on social media and Zoom. So it's a pretty simple matter to take a very capable university president with a very sound business idea and mobilize basically your entire faculty and a good piece of the student body who's coming in with your revenue and donors who are influenced by faculty. Many of your donors are brought in by faculty, who get inspired by, wow, you wrote this book and I just wanna help you all. So you have a job where you try to make a significant change and you can have a very short lifespan. And when people talk about this in private, that's how they talk about, which is uh, how much do you really want to push this? And plus, no one wants to be the university president that walks out of their office and there's faculty protesting there, and there's students sending you nasty grams and parents are thinking, well, what kind of leader do we have at this university? And the trustees, of course, are the people that are the most sensitive because most of the time they're not shareholders at Apple or computer. They're former grads. They're former sports stars, they're celebrities. They wanna feel good about being your board. So the university presidents, my hat is off to them. They've got the, probably the hardest productivity job in the country, except maybe reforming the federal government. And the fundamental issue of how really do you do that? Even if you're on the brink of bankruptcy, even if you're on the brink, of, you know, you probably just have to run out of money and be closing the doors before you could actually rally people and, you know, that's the sign of a failed business, of course. That sounds like two different people. They're the, two different, the, totally. The, the, the hospital guy or girl have to run a business and they've got to make payroll. And the ways in which they do it are not simply by asking for more money per se, because you probably are not going to get it anyway, since everybody else is looking for it. And on the other side, there's a... a person who is bound partly by the the ethos of being an academic himself or herself and the things they're looking at is, are a relatively small number of sources of revenue but in the end if you say well I produce a lot of revenue that's not necessarily seen as the best of all things because unless it's spent in a way that deals with those stakeholders it's not going to be very popular are the two inherently uh, are the two inherently antithetical that is when they talk to one another engage with one another is there a language they both speak and understand in in the best of this that's where you have to land but this 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 difference in environments that you've painted um, is the reason consultants, lawyers, and all of these professionals have thriving jobs. You have to, in the best world, combine a teaching hospital and a university environment. The person that leads the university is trying to attract and keep people happy and help them get productive without leaning on them too much, and is generally a process person, generally a peacemaker, 
generally trying to just put resources in and have all the boats float. And the person that runs the hospital is a decision person. They've got to go this or that way. They might be a process person, but they're heavily an outcomes person. They're heavily a decisiveness person. And when you combine these, you get to all the makings of people not having any idea what the other is saying, or when they finally figure out what they're saying, it's not meaningful to them because they can't operate that way on their side. And uh, this then gets to the matter of leadership, which is you know an age old question. Do you bring in esteemed university people to run these hospitals, or do you bring in business people from the hospitals to lead a university? And that's a work in process. You know, it's, uh, I think the business people land, quite a few universities have brought in a business-ish person, mm -hmm. and they don't take long to figure out what's wrong with the university finances. That's actually not a complex formula. What's complex is what you do about it that lets you and the organization survive the gauntlet. And we bring academic people into our hospitals and, you know, budgets expand and rep, you know, margins disappear. And there's all these programs that are put up that can't pay for themselves. And so we often find that, at least in our children's hospitals, there'll be a pendulum. We'll have a process academic leader. They spend all the money in the bank. They run out of kind of the viability of the place. And then a business person is brought in to kind of restore order. And after a few years of that, people look up and say, you know, the person's kind of too... Uh, much of a J personality, you know, they're just always pushing and coming up with goals. Can't we get somebody who just kind of makes us all feel better and move along? And there, of course, are people who do these things together. But the examples of people that rise to the top of these different business models oftentimes are very firmly in these, in these uh, phenotypes and in these behavior modes. That's how they got there. That's how they became successful. I appreciate your candor. And, and I really applaud you for that candor. And I also think it says that it's a miracle that these hospitals and research enterprises work as well as they do, which leads me, which leads me to a, one final question. Uh, it begins with a statement that came out of a February issue of JAMA. And this is what it wrote, they wrote at the time. The great scientific scientific achievement of 2020 was the development, testing, and approval of numerous vaccines in less than one year. 65 years earlier, the SALT vaccine was heralded as one of the greatest achievements of the 20th century. So what lessons ought we take away from these two achievements that I think all of us would agree on how important they are, but what do they mean for pediatric research? Well, we spent all this time talking about, uh, at least to my offered view, that social determinants and behavioral health and non-physical problems are kind of our next frontier of public health for kids, the next, uh, next road we need to walk. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, the broader infectious disease and viruses, we've conquered a lot of that. You know, that's old school. You know, the viral work was done, uh, you know, around the time we were born, right? So it's been going on for decades. And, and then here comes coronavirus, uh, antique old problem. And it, uh, you know, basically freezes the planet and kills millions of people. So the first thing that uh, I just offer as a reaction is, you know, we're still pretty close to mother nature. You know, we can talk all we want about our behavioral health and can we self-actualize and can we be happy and thriving. But in the end of the day, a respiratory virus can emerge at any time. The most fundamental thing, probably killing human beings for millions of years. And we don't have a solution for it. And it tears through the world's most advanced technical society, uh, just like a knife through butter. We actually closed down large pieces of the planet. And we couldn't really stop it at the end of the day. We could slow it, we could slow it down, but it's going to work its way through the population. And either by getting COVID-19 or by being vaccinated with COVID-19, we're all going to wind up with some of that virus in us. It's the only way around it. So if you look back uh, 
over 65 years. These physical problems are not trivial. They reinvent themselves in new ways. And um, it probably is going to keep us busily in the physical medicine business for a very long time. Um, we'll have to balance that and not let that take the air out of the room of relational health, of social determinant health, because making viruses and giving us shots, that's a technical business. That's what I group in with heart surgery and neurosurgery, cancer, and all these things. We can make this in a big extravagant factory. We deploy it. It's not a lifestyle piece, it's an injection and the, your body's gonna do the rest. Um, we just don't want the coronavirus and what it pretends to pull us back into a feeling that everything is solvable with technology. But in fact, our behavioral health problems are social. They're relational. They're, they're personal, emotional. And we can remediate the hard edges of that with pharma and technology, but that doesn't solve the problem. People are depressed for a reason, and the answer is not to take antidepressants and muck along. The answer is to try to figure out well, how you got there and how you remediate that. And that is not the coronavirus shot. So I would offer that as we kind of look back at the piece. Some old things are going to continue to be new. And that's going to be something that uh, we just don't want to have uh, forget, nor do we want that, though, to kind of guide the future totally. Uh, we have to move beyond that. I can tell why you've been doing this for 10 years. Uh, that's an extraordinary portrait of a world that is at once uh, one of the sources of great wonder and joy because of the success and triumphs. And at the same time, one that that old commercial used to say, don't fool around with mother nature. We are still back to dealing with fundamental biological processes and we're not quite ready to just solve all of that now. So it has been a real pleasure. I thank you very much for your time. And I hope that when on one of those long flights you have to take, you have an opportunity to identify 20 people who can fill either one of those jobs. <laughs> Please give me a call. I'd like to go talk to them. I will do that. Well, it's been a pleasure being with you. I will con We'll get the list together and I'll probably get into executive recruiting as my next <laughs> gig in life once I have that. Wait a minute. That, no, 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 no. Thank you very much, sir. You've been a great enjoyment. This has been a great deal of enjoyment for me. And more than important than that, it's been a great deal of insight. Thank you very much. Appreciate being with you. Take good care. Thank you for listening to Innovators, a production of Harris Search Associates. We'll have more insightful conversations with global thought leaders to follow.